everyone. Paul Bertarelli for AvWeb. With my teammates here, I'm about to commit free fall. You know, a lot of my pilot friends ask me, hey man, don't you kind of worry about your parachute not opening? Eh, not really. I got two of them. What I really worry about is becoming a hood ornament on a Cirrus, or worse, a Mooney. So in this video, we're gonna take a look at what it takes to operate safely around an airport that has parachute operations. But first, skydive. Cheated death again, and with a parachute packed by someone else. Imagine the thrill. Now, first things first about flying your airplane around or into skydiving drop zones. It's called freedom of the commons. Everybody who uses a public use airport has equal rights and equal access to the airspace and the runways. As a GA pilot, you're allowed to fly into any public airport you want, just as the skydivers also have a right to the airspace and the airport but we can't all be at the same point in space at the same time, so we share it through common courtesy, informed by knowledge. In other words, knowing how things work. If you're flying across country, you're gonna overfly airports. That's pretty much unavoidable. So it'd be good to know if there are parachute operations going on. So how do you do it? Well, it's not necessarily easy. Notums are often mentioned, and I'll get to that, but. The best take it to the bank method is through air traffic control. ATC owns the airspace and knows who's doing what. Now it's perfectly okay to fly across country not talking to anybody, but it's more perfect if you're in contact with the local ATC for radar traffic advisories. And you can do that whether you have ADSB or not. Not only will ATC know if skydiving is a thing at the airports you're near, they'll also know when it's going on. Skydiving aircraft are required to contact ATC before exiting jumpers with at least a five minute warning, spelled right out in CFR 105.13. Sounds like this. Welcome to approach, jump two is two minutes. Some aircraft use cost of the state case for regional jet force skydiving operations in effect one 1,000 feet and below for approximately the next one zero minutes. And by the way, there's no reason you can't file IFR, in which case ATC will keep you well clear of parachute activity. Next best in real time is the Common Traffic Advisory Frequency, or CTAF. It's right there on the chart, on your app moving map, or on the airport data page on your GPS navigator. While it's not a requirement, most skydive pilots give both a warning and a jumpers away announcement on CTAF. Sounds like this. If one way or clear the active alpha, Charlie. Cape Fear traffic, parachutes in two minutes over Cape Fear, 1-1000 1, and below. Parachutes in two minutes over Cape Fear, 1-1000 1, and below. It's just good airmanship to monitor the CTAF when you're near an airport, whether you're above the traffic pattern altitude or laterally displaced from it. As a flight instructor, I'm supposed to be a good scout here and tell you to check NOTAMs before departure. But look, we all know the NOTAM system is a broken down piece of crap. Hard to find the stuff that matters in a useless jumble of stuff that doesn't. And anyway, NOTAM information for airports with standing parachute operations is likely to be moved to this publication, the chart supplement, or what used to be called the airport facility directory. Chances of you having this in paper form is about equal to me being elected Pope, so look for it in online sources like AirNav, the FAA's digital chart website, or in whatever flight app you happen to use. ForeFlight has a specific function called PJA for Parachute Jump Area. That will highlight drop zone airports and allow you to zoom in on additional information. And while we're on charts, sectional charts or their digital equivalent and apps use the parachute symbol to signify a drop zone. Useful? Sure, but to merit the symbol, a drop zone has to have been in place for at least a year and conduct at least 1,000 jumps a year. Some don't and some that do don't have a symbol. Drop zones come and go, so the symbol may be out of date. Having identified a drop zone airport, how far should you plan to detour around it? Oh, I don't know, about 50 miles. Hey, just kidding. But in answering that, I would say this. 
Most pilots think skydivers are crazies who just jump out of the airplane and sort of fall straight down. What you might not realize is that our sport has crazies of multiple disciplines. For example, belly flyers and free flyers do sort of go straight down, although we do entertain ourselves by geeking the camera. Before we get out of the airplane, we do something called spotting, which sets the exit at a point where we can make it back to the drop zone under canopy. This is often done via GPS waypoint, but you still have to eyeball what's out there. This is what we see when spotting, and this is important for you to know because most of the spots are within or very close to the airport boundary, not two miles away, because if there's anything skydivers hate more than bitching about jump prices, it's walking back to the drop zone. At a drop zone with turbine airplanes, multiple groups will exit all along the wind line and space within the airport boundary or only a little outside of it. There are two exceptions to this. Canopy relative work, we call it crew, and wingsuit flying are also popular disciplines. On light wind days, crew groups tend to exit two or three miles on the downwind side and fly into the wind to get home while they assemble these magnificent canopy formations that terrify us normal crazies. Wingsuiters usually exit upwind, but they fly as far as three miles from the center of the airport, but usually a lot less. So when you're grazing by the drop zone, make it on the downwind side, about three miles, and you're good. Four miles if you're conservative. As shown in the cheap graphic here, various disciplines open at different altitudes, with crew jumpers highest, then tandems, then the rest of us. This is why it's never a good idea to overfly a drop zone airport when skydivers are active. Exit altitudes, by the way, vary from 5,000 feet AGL to 13,000 feet AGL for drop zones with turbine aircraft. But for special events like big waves and records, exit altitudes may be as high as 18,000 feet. Again, ATC will know all about this. Don't be afraid to ask, and don't be afraid to ask the jump pilot either. And here's an idea. How about ADSB? You've probably got ADSB out but it's cheap to have ADS-B in and run that on a moving map or an app. And you'll see where the jump aircraft is and its altitude, and that's a good hack on where the skydivers will be. What to do when flying into an airport with a skydiving operation? First, don't overthink this and get yourself into a lather. Remember what I said about equal access to the airspace and runway. It's no different than flying into an airport with a lot of traffic in the pattern. Okay, I lied. It's a little different, and here's why. Avoid at all costs flying over the middle of the airport at any altitude, but especially at pattern altitude during jump operations. I'll give you an example. The land Florida has a busy skydiving operation, and if I use runway 1230 as a for instance, it might seem perfectly acceptable to cross the departure end of 12 and enter a crosswind then turn downwind into the pattern, or maybe cross at midfield and turn left into the downwind. For the love of the baby Jeebus, don't do this. You'd be flying right through the parachute landing pattern, which would scare the hell out of everyone, including you. Here's another example from one of my favorite drop zones, Cross Keys in New Jersey. There's a helpful detail in the chart supplement. Due to parachute drop zone on the north side of the airport, all traffic to remain south of runway 927. This is kind of buried in the notes, but it's there. Since runway 9 is right traffic and 27 is left, remaining south is assured if you fly a standard traffic pattern with a 45 degree entry to the downwind. And that's the takeaway here. First, know the pattern direction and fly a standard entry to the downwind. The FAA says the downwind is supposed to be a half mile to a mile from the runway and skydivers under canopy rarely get that far out at low altitude because they can't make it back to the landing area. They're usually much closer in. So if you fly something low and slow, like my J3 or an old Champ, don't make the pattern too tight. This note, or some version of it, really ought to appear in the chart supplement for every airport with regular skydiving. Although, if it were up to me, I think I'd want to give it a little more tea. Sorry, I'm a frustrated South Park cartoonist 
and I somehow managed to escape adult supervision. When landing at an airport with a skydiving operation, just proceed with a normal landing, even if skydivers are landing to either side of the runway. Jump aircraft do this all the time and you can too. Just make sure the runway is clear and if you're a skydiver and an airplane is landing on the runway as you approach the grass, get used to it. Just don't cross the runway and taxiway at low altitude. So to review, check notums for jump operations. See the chart supplement notes for useful intel on details for that airport. Sweep the chart for the parachute symbol and pull up the ATC and CTAP frequencies before you get near the airport. If skydiving is going on, plan to jink to the downwind side by three or four miles. Your GPS can give you winds at altitude and ground winds from an AWOC will work in a pinch. If you're flying into the airport, just use a normal pattern and be at pattern altitude at least three miles out. And remember to extend courtesy to the jump aircraft and expect the same in return. For Abweb, I'm Paul Bertarelli. Thanks for watching. Oh, and one last thing. Stop being such a pansy and at least do a tandem. You'll never understand the sport of kings until you try it. <laughs> it never fails. Remember what I said about equal assets to the Arabs? God damn it! I need a drink. <laughs>